Welcome to the Geek to Geek podcast where we are saving daylight. I'm Void and I'm here with my co-host Beej. I don't know how to make a sound for daylight. Okay, we'll go with that. Um, Today we're talking about not daylight savings time, but we're talking about soft skills because this is something that we were talking about off air and I was like, we could probably do this on air. And that's kind of where it came from. There wasn't a whole lot else besides that. But basically... Like both of us are working in, I mean, I worked freelance for years being remote and having to like communicate with people. And now I'm in an office every day and I'm a manager and I deal with lots of people and I have people above me too. Um, And you're working full time again, you know, and doing content creation and you're working remote. So we just wanted to talk a little bit about like, there's this whole, I mean, there's skills, right? We've talked about our skills and where we're coming from and our backgrounds before, but we've never really talked about these like soft skills that are really hard to demonstrate on a resume or talk about or like I don't know people just don't give them the credit that they're due and it's all these little things that I've noticed just from being in an office now that I've had enough office experience and enough career experience basically yeah is that a good summary of what we're talking about yeah I mean it's the kind of things that you can't go to school for yeah I did a yes. presentation on this about uh, the last word camp that I went to and it's really about the kinds of things you can't go to school for you can't like you said that you can't put on a resume but it's what actually makes you hireable because it's what it, it's why you, they say you need the the five years of experience more than anything else it's the to learn how to do this this is what you get I mean, it's not entry level position either. It is actually this is kind of like wisdom. This is like workplace wisdom uh, is the way I look kind of look at soft skills. You can't learn it. You just like you can't be taught it. You just either pick it up or you don't. Yeah. So this might go pretty quick, but I just I don't know. We were talking about it and I thought it'd be interesting to talk it through. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was and it sounds so dumb if you haven't had to deal (laughs) with it before. But when you're sending an email, who you're sending it to who you're copying into it and who you're sending like a blind copy. So who you're CCing and who you're BCCing. Mm -hmm. And it, before I was a manager, I never really thought too much of it. It would be like, I would send the email and if it made sense, I would CC my manager. But now that I am a manager and I'm like a middle manager, I have to think (laughs) about, okay, do, are there other managers like at my level that would care about some of this info info? And like, do I just like CC them in or do I send them something so they can see the basics of it, but they don't actually need to be looped into the conversation or it's like, do I pull my boss in? Do I pull my employees into this or do I just email somebody directly? And it's like, right. it sounds so easy, but it can be very, very difficult sometimes to know when to do which thing and it's a skill that i feel like i have now but it took a long time to get there it took me until pretty much the last year that i was teaching and running the learning center to really get a grip on how to do that because there there are different dynamics in every office setting on who wants to be cc'd or bcc'd that it's something where you if you keep bcc'ing someone on a on a conversation it's there it could get on their nerves if they're too busy i mean you're flooding their inbox so you have to know when to do it like on truly important tasks and and communications that they'll need to know because you're really covering your own tail that's what a lot of the bccing is and when you cc stuff it's basically at least for me i usually cc'd people not to include them like I, i've learned that i used the two field the the, the main two field as this is who is involved in this conversation that every Everyone who is pertinent to that conversation is in the two field. Then the CC is when I want them to know that my boss knows about this, that uh, they're not going to be able to uh, to come back around. That's almost that uh, that like, yeah, look, I'm doing this. And I'm serious about it. And then BCC is when I'm having something that no one believed me about. Like, uh, I'm just like, yeah, I'm saying this. My boss told me to have this conversation or email somebody and I'll BCC them so that they know that I'm doing it. Yeah, and I mean, I don't use them exactly that way, but it's more about just like knowing that there are different uses for them and tweaking yeah. accordingly. Like a lot of the time, um, there are conversations where like I'll include a bunch of people in the two field and we'll be talking about yeah. things that are like high level, like proprietary company information. And we're going to have a discussion about it. But there are other managers like at my level that need to know the basics of what I'm sending in that first email, but they should not be included in the conversation. So you can send, you. you know, like a BCC. So they fall off of the thread right away, but at least they get like that core information, things like that, yep. that 
I don't know. It's it's weird. It's just it comes with time, you know. Yeah, and they know that it's going on. They're not going to be included in the conversation, but they know that you started it, that you're doing this. And I mean, it's something that I'm really, really glad that I don't have to deal with anymore. That my company doesn't use email. I'm so happy about this that we have email addresses and it's how we can communicate and get people to email us from outside places where you know we don't give somebody our gmail or our 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 other business account or something like that but it's between each other i haven't actually emailed one of my superiors or or uh, teammates since uh, i was brought on uh and given access to slack like we actually use slack for the email replacement that uh that they brag about and i don't i don't know if you guys do because i know you have a slack but we actually do it and it works magnificently i really hate using email now because of how how easy it is to to communicate with somebody on slack yeah um um, I'm thinking about doing like my company doesn't, but I'm thinking about doing Slack for my team because it does work really well. I use it for like side projects and I use it with friends and I'm on yep. Slack all the time. I just haven't really found the right work situation for it. But yeah. as my team gets bigger, I'm more and more tempted to move on to Slack for like collaboration. And with us being remote, having Slack with real time communication like that is just it's magnificent for us to get to know each other and be able to joke around. And I mean, we're in different time zones. A lot of us, we have someone in England and we have someone I cannot remember where she is right now. She's in different places. She might be in Belgium right now. And uh, it's like completely different time zones and parts of the world that that we're in, but we're able to come together we do the voice the video chat meetings in in the mornings and then but we have or and we have slack that uh is just there we're joking sending each other gifts and uh i mean i posted the same thing in that slack as i did in our uh, geek to geek slack about part of my weekly geekery today because i thought they would enjoy it as much as uh, as y'all would and the listeners would it's in there now part of it is like i work in an open office too so it's like i turn <laughs> right. my left and i'm talking to my team you know they're like That's right true. there so it's it's kind of a different situation but it, it would be nice for remote work for sure and it kind of ties into one of the other things i want to talk about here where it's like what like medium do you use to communicate with people are you using email are you using a phone call or like when do you just walk over to somebody and yep. Again, it's something that just like came with time. Like there's no hard and fast rule with it. And you start to learn who prefers like which method of communication and who is more readily available. If you were to just like walk over to their desk that you can like, that's the best way because they're probably open to talk. And there are other people that just can't and they're always slammed. And it's like, okay, send them an email, you know, give them uh -huh. some time with it. And I don't know. It's unless it's absolutely necessary, you speak to them right then. It's kind yeah. of that four that four quadrant, you know, urgent and important, urgent but not important, not important, not urgent, and all of that. Where you that's really where this kind of thing comes in. It's like if you absolutely need someone, you don't email them. Yeah, I mean, phone calls are kind of extreme these days too, just because yeah. the nature of the world. Like you don't usually. I mean, I call people outside of the company way more than I call people inside the company. You know, if it's someone inside the company, I'm usually either emailing them or I'm like just going to get yep. up and go over and talk to them. And see, for us, it's direct messaging that we do most of the time that when we get on a, a call, it's usually a video call or a Slack call where we talk about something that would take way too long to go through the uh, the voice chat. And one of the uh, things that I've that I got really scared because, like you said, phone calls are really rare that I've been working here maybe a month maybe a month and a half and I'm at lunch and look down and my supervisor is giving me a phone call it's not through slack it's not through uh it's not through anything else and it's a phone call and I'm like oh my goodness what happened and it turns out it was the day I got a new phone I hadn't turned slack on yet uh, and forgot about it and uh, I had a, a software key that he needed like now immediately then and it really scared me because of how rare phone calls are that every everything it's handled a different way and when it came through there i was like oh my goodness something is catastrophically wrong right now <laughs> it's so funny um yeah and i mean i guess it, that kind of ties into working remote too which is one of the right. things that like i don't know there's a balance to be had about knowing when you can work remote and like not abusing it not pushing it it's different for you because you're working remote every single day right but you know i was in your position too when i was freelancing and there's just like being like almost over communicative and also being right. super responsive 
like those are kind of the two key things to being able to work remote and be effective at it you know yes. and knowing like, when to be responsive that's yeah. another thing that that i've learned now that i've been doing the remote thing and freelancing for over a year i know when to respond to an email or a slack message and when i see it that it's like okay i'll handle this tomorrow that's not anything that i have to do or you know i know that you've done it while we've been uh recording or set not recording but setting up where you're like oh nope got to do this right now and it's uh it's just a normal thing to just learn which ones you need based yeah. on your business well and i built a lot well i wouldn't say that i built my client base on being responsive but i would say that i maintained my client base when i was a freelancer full-time because i was responsive right. And I had almost every one of my long term clients tell me that they loved working with me because they knew that they could get an answer like immediately. Right. Like and my basically when I was when I had the time, when I was doing it full time for freelance work, I would tell everybody I will return your call, email, whatever within 24 working hours or like right. one business day, basically. And that's what I would kind of guarantee for my you know ongoing projects, my retainers. Right. But then I would I, I would respond within like 30 minutes every time just because that's my style. And it's amazing right. how many people don't do that. Like now that I have to work with outside vendors at my current job, um, yeah. the amount of people that won't respond to an email or won't give me a phone call back, or it's like, I'm trying to give them money for a service they want to sell me. <laughs> and like, I can't get a hold of them. It's, it's ridiculous to me. So that like being responsive is one thing. And the other side of it is that like speed of business where sometimes like being able to accurately judge a timeline on something like business only moves at a certain speed and when you're lucky you can be at one that moves fairly quickly but a lot of the time you have to think through all of the steps of something and then you realize that oh this project isn't huge but it's like oh that'll actually take three weeks because of the different people it has to go through and how long each one will take and how busy their schedules are and where it falls in their priorities and it's just like sometimes it's really frustrating but it's also a skill that like you can get by working in a business for long enough you can learn like how long things take and again this is such a soft mm -hmm. skill like saying oh i know how long things take that doesn't sound impressive but in a way it's actually really really useful well i know it, it is and it's something that everybody has to really know their own speed to be able to learn that and my my i mean I blog for a living and that is absolutely fantastic. I blog and live stream. There is no like dream job kind of stuff. And the re one of the things that I was talking about my supervisor, uh, talking to my supervisor about was the idea that people think that that is a very easy laid back job. But I mean, I have a quota of 4,000 to 1500 word articles a week, uh, researching, uh, every major, uh, WordPress publication out there and then doing a, a live stream based on it and reading all of them and being able to uh, to push them out. And that's something that if I hadn't had the experience of like hobby blogging over the last like eight years and being consistent about it, you know, like you have uh, with a green mushroom, it's it's something that that other people wouldn't be able to do because it's just the speed of being able to ration out your time and knowing like every week we have a we have our like it's basically a stand up meeting but it's the the team meeting on video chat where we say okay these are, this is how long it's going to take me for each of these tasks and plan out the week so that we know we're all going to stay on the same schedule together well, and even and like it's, podcasting too like all the stuff that goes into this every week like you mentioned that right. that helped you because now you have to do that on your own for your job right and it's uh, luckily mine streaming and not uh podcasting yet it may eventually i mean we're talking about a hundred different things of all of you know growing all the time uh but nathan's the one who does the podcast right now but um the editing and stuff like that just knowing how long this kind of thing takes and the live streaming and setup and just how to do it I'm so much faster than I ever would have been if I didn't have two years of experience uh, doing this. Like podcasting legit helped me get my job because of having those soft skills of just being consistent with it. Like you and I made the decision that we were never going to miss a week unless it was absolutely something catastrophic. And we haven't yet. Like we've published something every week. One of us might have missed uh, one or two here or there, but the 
podcast has been put out every week. And that kind of thing is something that you cannot learn. I mean, it's we made a decision and we stuck to it. And that's one of those soft skills that hiring managers look at uh, just because, like you said, people don't respond. People don't turn stuff in. You're wanting to give them money and they just don't give it to you so that you can hand them a check. And it's, you know, that's the kind of thing that you just have to learn as you go yeah yeah and one i don't don't know i guess talking about the timing and stuff too it makes me think about the ability to schedule meetings correctly is another (laughs) thing that it's it sounds like it should be easy you just like block out some time and you go talk to somebody but it's like at this point i'm able to gauge within 15 minutes of like how long something's going to take and you know when you're doing a 15 minute meeting that's easy when you're doing a 30 minute meeting it's pretty easy too but do you know the difference between a 30 minute meeting and a 45 minute meeting and an hour meeting like you know do you really need the conference room for an hour or do you just need it for 45 minutes and then it gets really tricky when it's like do you need to have a two and a half hour meeting what does that look like and how much can you get through in that amount of time and Did you schedule way too much time or not nearly enough time because it's such a huge topic? And then you have to like other people. Oh, sorry. Well, no, and other people. And then it's like, you know, if it gets to be that big, it's like, do you break it up into multiple meetings? And then, okay, well, how many people am I pulling in for two and a half or three hours? Like, am I wasting the CEO's time here? Should this really be a couple different meetings with a couple different groups? It's... It's weird, but it's a useful skill once you kind of get your head around it. And then once you actually have those, it's trying to make sure that you hit the right balance of of that time. Like you said, you have to know what you're going to be able to get through. But if somebody has to leave early, like other people have other meetings scheduled that someone else might not be able to meet until, you know, you're an hour and a half in of a two and a half hour meeting. Somebody else, person X, has to go over to their next meeting. So if they have something and they, you know, People tell you early about stuff like that usually, but uh, you have to make sure that you get any pertinent information to them during the time that they're there without disrupting the overall flow of how you have to how like how present to everyone else. And that's something that the first few times that you run a meeting, you're going to mess up. Like everybody does. It, it it turns into just this cluster of awfulness. But then after that, you learn. And like you said, judging it is it becomes a lot easier. Not necessarily easy, but easier. Yeah. Well, and there's also the whole thing. It's like, OK, you kind of need time between meetings. Like you have to use a bathroom. You got to get some water. <laughs> like you need yeah. to let your mind have like a five minute break. So you probably need like 15 minutes between intense meetings. And it's very easy to forget to do that and just do things back to back. And then suddenly you have six hours of meetings with no breaks. And you're like, ooh, wait a minute. Um, yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, a pitfall. Um, I guess the other main thing that I wanted to mention, like from my perspective on soft skills is I've realized more and more that a lot of my job and a lot of what I was good at as a freelancer too, without really realizing it, just being able to facilitate communication between different groups. And it's because I have like such a wide like variety of things in my background at this point that like I can speak designer, I can speak developer, I can talk video production, I can talk to a digital marketer, I can talk like general corporate speak, and I can also speak executive, which is very different than general corporate speak. And translating between these different groups is like easy for me at this point but if i think back to all of the things that add up to it it's not actually an easy skill and it's a skill that not many people have like if i didn't have the last 15 years of my background there's no way i could do what i do now just because i can flip from development mode into executive speak in like half a second and i can translate between these different groups and again it's such a soft skill it's so hard to prove But once you've been in enough meetings, once you've been in enough situations in a company, people start to go to you for that ability. Yes. And they will bring you to meetings that you have no business being in just to be able to be the mediator between. That was one of the most frustrating things. I mean, it's great. I mean, people recognized that they eventually recognized that in us, but or in you, I, I guess I should say. But they would come in and bring me meeting, bring me into meetings that I cared zero about, had zero input, was not in my field at all but it was basically because these two disparate groups that could not talk to one another 
I was able because I was I really was in the middle of them to be able to to really act like a translator and be like, no, that's 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 not what they're talking about. Here's what they <laughs> here. OK, here's what they don't they don't understand the technology and that's fine. But this is what you need to do. Uh, talk like talking to the IT people that uh, I got way more done than my than most people on campus because I knew technology. They would ask for something. Our IT guys d- had no idea uh, what they were talking about, so they put it off to the side, which happens, or they would be like, they're asking me to do something ridiculous, and uh, or they don't need all of this, and have to, I'll have to figure out how to get them permissions to do that, or adjust this database, and all just everything that goes in with it, and I go in, and I'm like, I need this, 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 and this permission to do this, this, and that, and they're like, Oh yeah, here you go, and yeah. uh, that would people would come to me to do that. Be like, hey, you're really good with Jake, and you get him to do this for me. I'm like, mm-hmm. What are you gonna do for me? <laughs> wow. Well, I mean, part of it that I found too is also like when people don't always know when they're talking about um other skill sets or other tasks. I mean, development's a really good example that I could use here, yeah. but like when they have a list of asks, they don't know what's easy and what's hard. You know? <laughs> yes. So like having the background I do, I can look at asks from like an operations team or an executive team and it could be a list of three things and i can say this like number one i can have done today number two is going to take two weeks number three is going to cost you twenty thousand dollars plus five hundred dollars a month and is going to take three months and like in their mind they're all the same and it's just not it's not true so having that background to draw on becomes super useful that was actually a big part of my cover letter that I was sending out that landed me this job that was being able to to really, you know, say that I'm not the best person for this job, that that I'm not the most talented person to do this. And uh, it was and it's the truth. I mean, I'm not the best blogger they could have ever hired or streamer or podcast or anything like that. But because of those things, like I made a point to to tell them and show them in my cover letter what it was that I, w- I knew how to do, like speaking designer, developer, and gave specific examples that, like I, I said in my presentation, was I'm absolutely not the best person for this job, but I was the best personality. And that's really where these soft skills are, that it comes into just being a part of who you are and it's impossible to separate and honestly impossible to turn off once you start doing it because you see it yeah yeah it's really interesting do you have any other high level stuff i think i hit on most of mine that i want to talk about well one thing that I, i i have found the most useful and it's very hard for a lot of other people is that the probably the hardest soft skill that for, for other people is listening. That when somebody comes in dealing with, with the public, especially when you're having to deal with customers or someone who's irate, that most people don't want any kind of, of solution. That when there's a problem on your team, they're not really looking for you to solve it unless it is, you know, a catastrophic problem, you know, it being unable to work with somebody. But if they're coming to you to talk, just listen to them. Come up with a, yeah, man, I've been there. It's a, here's what happened to me. I feel you. Um, and most people will calm down after that by being genuine with them. Like learning how to be genuine with another human being will get you further in a lot of, of business situations I've learned. And I mean, I don't know. I've never been in a, a full on like corporate office, but in all of my freelancing, all of my teaching, all of all across campus uh, and every business I've owned, like the number one thing that got people coming back was my being genuine and being honest with them that uh, I got yelled at by the administration of my school because I told them that the admission counselors were lying to them because they were saying that we had this degree and that's not a degree, that it was a plan for them to go with a two plus two to a different school, that we have a track that will lead you there. You will not leave this school with with that degree. And like I got yelled at for being honest with the students because they wanted the money and uh, tuition money. And it was not something I was going to do. And but I had a reputation for that because I was going to do that. And it's honestly served me better than any other soft skill that I could have gotten that I could have really uh, fostered was just like being straight up with people. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a really good one, too. Cool. Um, well, thanks for talking about it. Like I said, this is kind of a weird topic, but we were talking around the edges of it just in text and stuff. So I wanted to 
cover part of it. Uh, we also have a podcast network. If you guys don't know by now, a uh, Geek Podcast Network, and you should be listening to everything on it because I do, and I have fun. <laughs> um, this week, Tea Time with Katie and Chelsea, they talked about Almost Midnight by Rainbow Rowell. Uh, Geekitude, they, Joe talked about to David Acampo and Paul Montgomery about the margins, which was interesting. And then on the comic box, Rob had a guest host on and did a review of Black Lightning. So you can check all those out from this week. They're all good. Besides that, probably time for our weekly geekery uh why don't you go first and actually your last one hold off on that because i have that too okay absolutely so i'm still reading oathbringer and this is like i'm i'm working through it i'm about a third of the way through it i think last night i actually hit 33 percent through it and it's absurd how long this book is because i'm reading this at every every moment i have uh to spare i'm pulling it up on my phone and reading it um but it is i am i am just like loving this this is by far the best of the cosmere books i think i'm at least so far the way they're putting it together and i have gotten to the point where there there was a, a couple of characters coming in that i my stomach clenched and I got really frustrated and felt my pulse come up like rise whenever things were happening. I, I, I'm so invested in this that I'm so because I did that reread like Oathbringer is worth getting through these massive books for sweet. And it is just awesome. Good, um, I'm glad you're liking it. And so Sunday I was uh, Sunday. I went for a 10 mile run and it was the longest run that I have I've done so far in this training. And it was really hard for like the last mile and a half and I got in I, I I ate this giant protein cookie and it was awesome the Lenny and Larry cookies so good and like I was eating this cookie and I'm scrolling on my phone looking at runner's world and I'm in this kind of post-run euphoric like high and I there's an article about my favorite YouTube channel the ginger runner who was published uh who has made a new documentary that released last week called where dreams go to die and it's about the Barkley marathons you liked that uh documentary on Netflix right I did yeah it was super interesting okay. it was like oddly compelling one of those things okay. where I was like I didn't know what I would think going in but then by the time I got like I don't know it, it was like I kept watching out of fascination but not like really into it and then suddenly by this point you're like half hour in you're like no i'm gonna see this through yeah and okay i'm the same way and where dreams go to die is ethan newberry the guy who runs ginger runner did a two-year documentary of uh, his name is gabe uh gary gary robbins excuse me his name is gary robbins and he's a like a renowned ultra marathoner and he's like coming first in things like a uh, western states and a lot of the the major ultra runs and it goes through two years of him training and doing the barkley marathons and it is magnificent void it is so wonderful and like it is one of my favorite documentaries right now because the ginger runner because ethan knows how to actually film things that's one of the thing the main points that that i loved about this is it kind of reminds me of ingredients that food documentary where they pay attention to the actual cinematography of it that he actually used shots like he knew how to make the i'm writing a review on my blog right now that i thought i was going to finish today but i couldn't get to it with work but the way i put it is like he knows how to make the camera feel like a character instead of a tool that you're watching something through That's and cool. like I loved this movie and it's seven dollars uh to buy right now what I really like about it is like it is magnificent a lot of the proceeds are going to charity and like it's seven bucks to download uh right now and it's going to be free on YouTube later in the year and uh, there's gonna be a commentary track on it with him and Gary uh that's coming out next month or the next uh, whenever they can get it recorded and pieced together that's eleven dollars and I'm like I watch this guy's YouTube videos all the time. I'm going to support him and pay this 11 bucks and watch this. And it turns out that it is absolutely beautiful. That it is, it, it's intense and engaging. And it made me feel way more of the intensity of the Barkley Marathons than the actual Barkley Marathon documentary did. And they say going into this movie that if you haven't watched the original documentary, watch it first because they don't go in and waste any time on explaining what it is or how it runs or anything. They just go into it with this guy training and going up to it. And it is it is really compelling because it's a personal story of why in the world would somebody do this to their body? It's 
It's crazy, and it is so good, and you need to go download it and watch it and put it on your list. I will put it on my list, but you let me know when it's free on YouTube. That's when I'm going to watch it. <laughs> All right, I'll do that. Yeah, I don't, um, know, I don't know the guy, and I don't know that. Uh, no, I, I'm glad you're supporting it because it's someone that, like, it's a creator that you pay attention to, and, like, I, I do that all the time. If it's a creator right. that I know and enjoy their work, I try to give them money whenever I can, but for something out of the blue like this, like, no, I'll wait. You let me know when it's free, and then I'll check it out. All right. Okay. Um. And then uh, you said I had to wait on this one. So. Well, it, you have Jessica Jones, but I want to talk about it <laughs> yeah. too. Um, so uh, basically, before we get to that, I, I just wanted to mention, like, I tried a bunch of shows and movies this week, and that's kind of like the bulk of where my geekery was. Um, but it was trying things to see if they would stick. And I ended up crossing off a bunch of my list after just watching, you know, 15 minutes or one episode or 30 minutes or whatever. And like last season, I tried to mention kind of everything I was doing in Geekery. And this season, I'm yeah. trying to, if I don't have anything interesting to say, like if I, even if I didn't like it, if I have something interesting to say, I will bring it on the show. But I felt like there were a ton that I crossed off the list and I was just like, nah, didn't stick. But I don't really have like thoughts that are worth sharing, you know? Sometimes yeah. that happens. Um, so I'm trying to be better about that this season with my Geekery so I don't have to cover absolutely everything I do. But there were also two that I mentioned that are good that I don't think I have a whole lot of thoughts about either. But I can say, <laughs> these are good. Maybe go check them out. So I watched The Big Sick, which is yeah. Kumail, and I don't know his last name, which I already feel I, bad about. Yeah, I, I know. I can't remember any of the actors' names in yeah. this, but I loved this movie. But it's the true story. Well, it's the mostly true story. They adapted it for, like, you know, making it a better movie, basically. But it's a mostly right. true story about – it's basically about him meeting his current wife, but when he was still doing stand-up comedy and – they dated for a little while and then they kind of broke up because it touches on family. It touches on like being an immigrant and how like immigrant culture can like affect and, you know, arrange marriages and stuff like that. But he wanted to be with her and then she gets sick. Like she suddenly catches the disease. So, but the thing is like, in a way, if you read the synopsis, you feel like it's almost like the notebook, you know, like a depressing type of drama movie. And it but is it's not. So it's not a comedy. Like it's a good comedy. And it's like, the, him and his wife co-wrote this about their relationship when their relationship was new. So there are like so many, you can just feel the grains of truth in this story, right? Yeah. And I think that's what makes it really compelling. Um, but yeah, beyond that, I mean, that's the premise of it. It, it was just good. Like, and I don't think I have very many thoughts besides it was good and you should probably check it out. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to say about it. I think it won a Golden Globe and I don't remember if it got any Oscars or not, but I think it was nominated for something. And it's an Amazon original. I think the big thing here is that it's an Amazon original that is this good, that it's winning awards. And Amazon has put out some some really good stuff. And this is one of the best ones they've put out because this this was a theatrical release from Amazon Studios that's also available on Prime. And it it is so good that it's funny. The characters are all really, really, really charismatic. And well, they feel like, genuine. Yeah. You know? They do. That, I guess that's the best way to put it. You're absolutely right. That these people feel genuine because the two writers understood the characters so well because they're real people i mean it's like they're their parents and families and friends so they're able to highlight what is actually interesting about them while still letting them be flawed and it's it's really 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 awesome and touching and the synopsis didn't do anything for me but jennifer and i sat down to watch it because we've been hearing so many good things about it and it's one of the best movies i've seen all year it was it was great yeah cool well the other one that i saw that again is good and like i could recommend it if the premise sounds interesting is marvelous miss Maisel. which have you watched that one i haven't seen i keep seeing this being recommended by just about everybody but i have never seen any of it i know nothing about it actually okay i can recommend it and tell you the premise but i don't know what makes it good like i i don't know <laughs> this is one that i haven't actually formed my thoughts around it um it's a female in the late 50s um, she has two kids, she's married, and in the first episode, I'm going to give spoilers because it's the whole premise of the show, but um, her husband is, like, into comedy as, like, his side activity, and they kind of, like, she supports them, it's a thing that they do as a couple, but he's the, like, comedian, right? And right. he's not very good, and then she finds out that, like, he's stealing bits from, like, famous people because he's like, that's what everyone does to get started. And, you know, they're going to, like, they're not, he's not a professional. He's, like, going to comedy nights, like, stand-up nights type of thing. Um, and the first episode, 
he leaves her and asks for a divorce, basically. And so she goes on kind of like a tirade and doesn't know what to do with herself and goes to the comedy club and off the cuff does an amazing set. And so she's actually the comedian of the two of them. And the whole rest of the season is about her coming to terms with like, it's kind of a period piece because it's about being a woman in the late 50s and um, like it's almost early 60s, but late 50s and like, you know, all of the connotations around divorce during that time, but then also coming into her own voice and learning to be like a stand up comedian when women weren't really stand up comedians and huh. kind of speaking about like the truth of everyday life through the lens of stand up comedy, right? And being able to talk about her kids and her husband who left her and what it's like to be, you know, single or divorced or whatever, but doing it on stage and in a funny way. So, wow. Again, it's one that like, that's the premise, and I don't know why I liked it. I, I kept watching it, though, and I watched the whole thing, and if there was a second season, I would watch that, too. Well, it's one, uh, that, that sounds like just a fantastic show. I'm learning over time that the things that used to really drive my interests in terms of television and movies are changing and it's not necessarily it's not necessarily what it is but there's so much good content out there like you and I have talked about before that I'm having to kind of expand what I'm interested in because the bases of the the foundations of the stories that I always liked were characters like Battlestar Galactica it's great that it's a space robot war but I care about those characters and that's kind of the way it is with the big sick and what it sounds like uh Miss Maisel is because it's uh it's about her it's about that character and following her and and everything that happens where that is the draw and i don't know I do, i'm just glad that they're taking that kind of of perspective and approach on tv right no, i now. guess no that's a really good way to put it because i was trying to think like usually when i have something i like i have a lot of thoughts around it but both of these so the big sick and marvelous miss Maisel, they are character pieces and Maybe that's why. It's just that the right. characters in these are compelling and interesting. And that right now with stuff like this, and is is Marvelous Miss Maisel a uh, uh, Netflix original or something like that? It's an Amazon. Amazon. It's an it's Amazon. Okay. Yeah. But it's kind of unlike what the other ones I watched this week. So I wanted to also talk right. about Star Wars Rebels and Jessica Jones. And I know you got to Jessica Jones in some respect too. But like right. Star Wars Rebels, I I finally like kind of forced myself through the last season, and. You know, it's the same thing that Rebels and Clone Wars has always been. It's hit and miss. Every time they're into the Jedi stuff, the Jedi philosophy, expanding like the mythos and the lore around the Force, I am all in, right? Like my right. eyes are yep. on the TV. I'm listening to every word. I'm paying attention to like every shot. And then there are entire episodes where I'm on my phone checking Twitter for literally half an hour just waiting for the episode to be over just in case there's something interesting in there. But it's like, yeah. you know, Mandalorians, okay, I get what they're about. I don't really need to know more or droids or, you know, there there's a lot of things that I'm just like, yeah, okay, it's an episode to fill the time. But every time, especially with this last season, every time it was like a Jedi-focused episode or a Force-focused episode, I really, really enjoyed it. And it had a strong finish too. So... The, I mean, it's done now. That was like the series yep. finale, not even the season. And you said that you read the synopsis but didn't watch it, right? Yep, I read the synopsis. I've been keeping up with the big kind of, of beats of the show that are going on, and I have no desire to watch it right now, which is really weird because I was all in on Rebels for a long time, and I just kind of fell apart, fell off of it. And, I mean, I, I can watch it on Disney XD. Uh, I can, you know, get it on the on-demand on what is it, Disney now and i i like the idea of it but i've not had fun watching it so i just wanted to know what happened and i know what happened in the finale and it is fantastic that the finale really does some cool stuff but i will eventually probably maybe get to it and having it spoiled isn't going to bother me because at that point i will just you know it's going i'm going to experience it and i just have no desire to watch it but i wanted to know what happened okay so i wanted you to say that because that is exactly how i felt with jessica jones season two i watched okay. the first episode and it just didn't hook me and i had to pause about 45 minutes into the hour-long episode to go help my kids with something and then i mm. came back and sat down in front of it and i just didn't want to continue and it wasn't that i hated it it was just that it was like there was no feeling whatsoever like nothing had happened nothing was grabbing me it was just kind of meh 
And I was like, oh, man, if this is the first one that's trying to hook me, like, I can't even imagine what the next few episodes are like. So, you know, it, it's just kind of like in my mind, like what happened to the pacing? Like the first season of Jessica Jones, every episode left me wanting to immediately start the next episode. Yes. And I didn't feel that at all with this first one. So I put it down. And since everybody wants all of the SEO on these Netflix shows <laughs> right when they come out, um, the next morning I checked and there were already like three different um, episode by episode recaps of the entire series. So I started reading plot synopsis like point by point, <laughs> like full episode recaps, right? Not like a Wikipedia yep. synopsis, but like in detail synopsis because these people want the SEO hits. And yep. um, I read through the entire season and then I went, okay, it sounds like it kind of gets interesting around episode 11. So hmm. I, I watched 45 minutes of episode one. I read plot synopsis all the way through the end. And then I went back and I watched episode 11, 12, 13. And that felt about right for the season. There was a lot okay. of filler. There's a lot of things in the first half of the season that don't matter at all. And I don't think they knew the story they wanted to tell as much as they did in the first season. But how much did, like, did you have that reaction at all? Like, I just kind of feel like, the Netflix MCU has lost its shine for me. Well, I'm okay. I haven't started season two yet. And Jennifer and I decided that we're going to watch rewatch season one before we get into season two, because that's something that we've been wanting to do anyway. So we're just going to take this opportunity and just have it refreshed in our mind as we go through. So I haven't started season two yet. I know that it's about the, you know, the superhero origin thing. Yeah, that and, doesn't help uh, things either, because you know how I am with yep. superhero origin stories. I still think it's the least interesting part of any hero at all. Like It's just... And, it, whatever and i the reason i'm interested in this one and it goes back to what we were talking about earlier is that i like jessica i like trish i like these characters who are interacting together it's the reason i like the thor movies i mean the first two thor movies are not great they're the some of the worst ones in the mcu but i like those characters those people being funny and saying funny things to each other and that's the way i feel about jessica jones except minus the funny and i'm the same way you are when it comes to the Netflix MCU losing its shine that I started, I think, three, I think episode three, maybe, and got maybe five to ten minutes into it and just stopped. I haven't even read the synopsis for what's going on in it because I stopped caring so much about it. Which one? And Defenders eventually... or Iron Fist? No, what are you Iron Fist. About? Oh, okay. about Iron Fist. And I mean, I just stopped. I didn't care. And I haven't seen anything about the Defenders. I know enough about it to know they went with the with the hand stuff that they've been like building up to that's the least inter interesting part about any of this and I'm eventually going to watch it because I like Jessica and Luke and Matt's okay but I know that I don't need it for Jessica Jones season two and so I don't care enough to get to it right now and it's because the storytelling is not great and that I've heard that they don't have enough enough characterization in Defenders to really draw you in. No, it felt padded, and so did Iron Fist. And I think that being on Netflix, they should feel more freedom to play around with right. like season length and maybe cut some of these down to like six episode seasons or four episode seasons because there's some core to some of these stories that are like really good, but there's so much extra stuff around it that just fills time that right. doesn't need to be there. And I don't understand why they do that when they can make it any length they want because it's only on streaming. Like, write the story that you want to write and cut all of the filler. Like, that's what I want to see more on Netflix the, and in and Amazon and everything, you know, all the streaming services. And it's not as though that's unprecedented. That's the way that British TV has been for the last 30 odd years at least where there are shows that exist within its time frame that there are certain episodes and certain episode length and, and series lengths that once they're done, they're done. Life on Mars is a fantastic example of that, that I've watched, uh, the, I've watched the first and last episode of that because it was telling a story. It's kind of just like that. Okay, this is what we're telling. We're ending it. Kind of like Gravity Falls. Like, okay, here's the story we're telling. It. I'm ending it. And it's that's a great way to approach TV, even in a season. If you have a five-episode season, a six-episode season to tell the story you need to tell, do it. British TV yeah. has been doing it for, for decades. I mean, I'm 
I'm coming around to it more and more across all different mediums. Like I like comic books that have a beginning, middle and end. Like I like a really tight run of a comic book, you know, right. Those are the ones that have stuck in my mind. The ones that have a good story and then they're over. And yeah. same thing for like books. Like I don't want people to keep making sequels and continuations and a second trilogy after a trilogy that I like. Um, I want that author to move on and make a new thing. You know, like if there's a trilogy and it's like close to perfect in my mind, just leave it, just leave it alone. And, you know, I, I don't know. It's, it's something that like, I, it may, maybe it just comes with age, you know, and appreciating like <laughs> a thing can just be good. And then there doesn't have to be more of it. Right. I say this with star Wars in the back of my head that I never want to end ever. I always want more star Wars. So obviously there are exceptions for everybody, but it's still kind of interesting. Yeah. I mean, I feel the exact same way that there are some things that there are stories that just need to be one-offs and that's fine. They, yeah. There are these, like you said, these, these trilogies that it just needs to be a trilogy. There are duologies out there that I've had recommended to me, uh, like cyberpunk ones by, uh, called Damon's that there's two books. That's all it took to tell the story. That's great. And that's why I like uh, uh, shared universes in books, kind of like the Cosmere with Brandon Sanderson and the Dark Tower with Stephen King. It's, uh, it's that they're telling an overall story. They're telling the individual stories, but there's an overall narrative in the background that don't necessarily matter unless you know that they're there and i love that kind of thing where it ties things together but you don't have to know any of them uh yeah. any of the individual parts definitely that's cool i like that too um i guess the last thing that i have for geekery this week is more fortnite i have more Yay, fortnite thoughts fortnite. i know i know you'd be so excited um, <laughs> i'm so excited if i don't have new thoughts i'm not gonna i'll just say right, i'm still playing fortnite because it's i mean at this point it's basically my evergreen game it's what i'm doing while i'm listening to podcasts it's what i'm doing when i don't really know what to do and i'm having a lot of fun with it still but i do have new thoughts this week because i don't part of it is too there's like an ebb and flow to thoughts on a game especially you know, I always have initial thoughts. Like, that's what I always bring to this show. And then sometimes I have wrap-up thoughts, too, after I've finished a game or really, like, fully grokked it. But I felt like I got that out of my system for Fortnite, and then I kept playing. And there were a week or two where I was kind of like, I'm still playing it. And now that I've <laughs> kept playing it, I'm starting to have thoughts about it again that are in, like, new and interesting ways. Does that make sense at all? Yeah, you, you've passed that point where you are a beginner and you're learning, and you've hit that point where, okay, now you're going to master this. Now you're going to find out the intricacies of it. Now you're going to not just do the same thing over and over again. You're going to to branch out and see what a, what the gameplay actually is consists of yeah i wouldn't say i'm mastering it but i the rest of that well, sounds correct um so i played uh, a bunch of duos and squad with my brother which was really okay. fun so he recruited a couple of his friends from PUBG also and brought them over but we played we've played a bunch of nights now so it's really nice to just have a game that i know we can jump into for like 25 minutes for one match you know maximum like that's so nice with having kids the age that i have yeah. because i can jump out in between and it's not a huge commitment but it's also like long enough to be meaningful um and it's really fun to play with somebody when you're on discord and just talking back and forth i still play solo a lot but um you know just the fact that i finally got around to really doing duos and squad with like people that i mm. know and um one of the things that they mentioned because they're coming from PUBG is that Fortnite is faster, which is something that I knew, but I kind of forgot about along the way. And I forgot how much faster until they mentioned it, um, which is probably another reason that it clicked with me when PUBG didn't. So the maximum match time, I looked it up because once I started thinking about this, I had to know the maximum match time that can possibly be in Fortnite is 25 minutes. And okay. there is a new, that. Yeah, the, there's a new mode that they patched in this week that's a temporary mode, and they tweaked it a little bit, and that one is only 23 minutes. So they're playing okay. around with like the timing and stuff, too. I've also made a lot of progress on the challenges, which I still think are like my favorite part of the game. So I've done... Every week, there's 10 challenges that you unlock, and some of them are labeled hard, some of them are like not, and some of them are uh, you know non-combat, some of them are combat. There's a really nice mix in there. So I've done all of the season challenges that everybody gets for free. And then the, with the battle pass challenges that I told you about the other week, um, yep. I've done all except for one. So I've done nine out of 10 for week one, two, and three at this point. I'm feeling pretty good about that. It's awesome. The only ones I'm missing are like... <laughs> 
kill three people or eliminate three people in a certain area of the map because those are hard oh, to do. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I'm making a lot of progress and next week when the next one unlocks, I'm going to do that. And I'm still jumping in at least for like a round or two every day to do like my daily challenges, which is pretty cool. But I wanted to talk about the pace of like games as a service because this got me thinking right. this last week there was a patch that dropped for Fortnite, and the game is like consistently under development right now and this new patch that came out they patched in a limited time mode and i hadn't had one of these before i well there was one that i played a little bit of but the last one that was really cool was like right before i was playing the game and it was a 50 v 50 mode and this time they patched in a five teams of 20 mode i think they call it like 20 v 20 v 20 v like they actually spell it out because it's funny <laughs> wow. um yeah and the one right before this that was between those two there was like a golden weapons mode where every weapon on the map was golden so it was more right. like instant killy than a normal game would be but this tw- like five teams of 20 is it's really fun and it's oddly compelling but it's something that like <laughs> i think beyond two or three weeks you wouldn't want to keep playing it like I really have an appreciation for this as a limited time mode, whereas in past games, if something was limited time, I felt like, oh, I have to get in there and like get my rewards or you know get the mm-hmm. most out of it. And this one, I've played it a lot and I've really enjoyed it, but I also feel like, okay, when it goes away, it will have been enough time with it and it can go away for a while. And, and I was upset about that in Overwatch recently that my favorite part of the, the game recently has been Capture the Flag. That I've loved that just being an option for people to hop into in the arcade. And they took it out this week that I logged in. or They may have taken, taken it out last week and I just didn't log in. But I went into the arcade and there was no Capture the Flag. Even after they put in the competitive CTF and then they had a regular CTF. And that was one of my favorite things. Like I much preferred that to the normal game right now but or the typical game with the objectives because it was timed there was like a 10 minute timer on it and i knew i was going to be able to get in and get out in a break time uh when i was needing to take a break from work or do something else and the others can last a long long time sometimes and so i'm just man it i got really frustrated at that because it was not I don't know. It wasn't a limited time mode, but because there was competitive, I just kind of assumed it was going to be around for a bit. And then they took it away. I'm like, oh, well, I'm not playing this anymore for a while. Well, and that's one of the other things that I'm noticing, too, is that a lot of these games as a service games go months between meaningful updates, like months and months. And that's how I always felt with Overwatch. I, I like Overwatch. I mean, we did a whole episode about it and it made our like games of the year list that year. But it, and I mean, it, we're still talking about it. We're still it, talking but. about it. I still play it every once in a while. But it's like there's so much time between every meaningful update that like I just can't stay engaged with the game at all. I just it can right. it completely fails to hold me because there's way too much time between changes. And I think I've run into that before with a bunch of other games too. Like League of Legends comes to mind. And you know, mm. I see the meaningful updates from all of these like really popular games as a service. Like I know when, you know, Rainbow Six stuff came out the other week and is huge right now. And you know, uh League of Legends is always in development. So is Dota 2 and so is, you know, Overwatch. Like I see them. I I won't look at all the gaming sites, but Fortnite is the only one that is updating fast enough that it might be the right pace for me. Like Okay. It's actually keeping pace with what i want in terms of changes so i don't know it's just these fun temporary modes that they're bringing in and new challenges every single week makes a world of difference to me like always giving me something within the next week to look forward to is probably what's keeping me in the current loop that i'm having with the game and i'm just really enjoying it for that so i wish more games would give me more things to do more often i guess (laughs) And I'm I'm always on the fence on that because of my addictive personality, where if they keep giving me things on a weekly basis, then I really dig in and spend a lot of time making sure that that happens to the point where it becomes unhealthy. So when it becomes a monthly update, maybe that becomes something more that I can schedule out my time and know that I can accomplish it without having that uh, that dopamine hit taken away. And it uh, is still still something that i feel accomplished and it's not going to be unhealthy yeah that makes sense to me so Um, then it's just a different way you know our brains work differently on that one but the fact that there are games that do both of them that we just have to find the ones that work like that for us yeah and fortnite is just hitting the perfect tone for me right now i don't know how long i'm going to stay with it as an evergreen game but 
I still like it. I'm still playing it like almost every single day. So that's really good. The other thing, the last thing I want to mention about Fortnite is that it became the most watched game on Twitch ever this week. Wow. So I'm not the only one enjoying Fortnite. It has broken through to the mainstream in a really weird way. And I don't know why, but it's a way that like a lot of the gaming press I follow doesn't seem to have latched on to yet. The fact that this game is just gigantic out there, which you were mentioning the other week on YouTube, right? Yeah, I mean, every recommendation, like I'll watch gaming channel stuff. I'll watch gaming videos all the time. And so my recommendations are coming through, uh, you know, because you like gaming things, dude. And it's it's Fortnite videos. It's Fortnite live streams. And they are uninteresting and it's not because and i think this is one of the reasons why i don't like the game i mean it's not terribly fun for me to play but i could go in and play a few games and then leave i mean it was fine uh but i think what i really don't like is like i said the other day on one of our other casts it's this the culture around it uh the people who are getting recommended are not the kind of people i want to watch or play or play with and so whenever it keeps getting thrown in my face with those kinds of people it's uh, it kind of puts a bad taste in my mouth. Like, I love hearing you talk about this. Like, all oh, this is great. This is awesome. But I'm, and I'm glad that it's the most watched game on Twitch. That means that for people like you who really love it, there are going to be a lot of updates coming. I mean, if it's that popular, they're going to get a lot of money uh, so they can continue development. But I just, I don't get why it, like you said, if for some reason it's just, exploding in the mainstream and it's just it's in my youtube channels everywhere (laughs) yeah yeah it is and i mean like i guess part of it is and i've talked about this before so i won't go super deep but i don't really engage with gaming communities anymore i just don't have time for that i have my groups of friends online And like one of the first things I did the very first night that I downloaded Fortnite was turn off all voice communication in the game. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I've never regretted that once. Like having real people that are real friends of mine, um, my brother and his friends and like other people online that I finally got around to playing with this week. We use Discord. Like, I'm not going to use the in-game chat. I don't want to be around those people. Um, No, not at all. I'll make my own community with my own friends, you know. And... Yeah, so I I can't argue with your points, but I also have found ways to just completely not even think about the community, and that kind of works for me in a weird way. Yeah, Yeah. and I understand. I turn the voice chat off in Overwatch every single time I log on, and uh, people yell at me for it sometimes. I'm like, I'm not listening to you. Like, I have no desire for you to curse at me and throw racial slurs at me. I'm going to play this character that I'm better at than you are, and then I'm going to log off and go to my job yep. and it, it's like I don't want and like you said we have these communities that we've built up around us that that we we keep around because our listeners are awesome and a lot of the people I talk to online now are listeners from this podcast and those are the people I want to talk with I love being able to get on with somebody and play a match or two of Overwatch or something else and uh, and do that that's awesome but just some rando who wants to Hanzo I'm like mm-mm like, nah, bud. Nah, bud. <laughs> okay, well, we'll leave it on that thought. Uh, you guys can write to us with comments, <laughs> suggestions, or feedback. Our email address is geek geekcast at gmail.com or reach us on Twitter at geek to geekcast We have longer discussion threads on the subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash geek to geekcast And like we were talking about earlier this episode, uh, we're on Slack all the time, so you can go to slackgeek geekcastcom for your invite. And remember, like we said earlier, once again, you can head over to geek to geekcastcom and see all of the shows in our podcast network. I blog at agreenmushroom.com and you can find me at GRN Mushroom. That's Green Mushroom without the E's on Twitter. And I'm on Twitter as at Professor Beach. That's Beach with two E's. And I blog at runningshoes.tv. We've been Void and Beach with your Geek to Geek podcast. That'll do it for this week. See you next week, geeks. Bye, geeks. Woo, sun sound. Comics. Hey everyone, Rob here, your friendly neighborhood comic geek, inviting you to join me and my rotating cast of co-hosts each week on The Comic Box, where we tell you everything you need to know to become a world-class comic book geek. So join us for The Comic Box, each week, right here on the geek to geek Podcast Network. 
Hi everyone, I'm Katie. And I'm Chelsea, and we are the hosts of Tea Time with Katie and Chelsea. We are two best friends who love pop culture and talking about pretty much whatever we want. Katie! Yes? Stop thinking about Zac Efron and tell our future listeners what some of our latest episodes have been about. Well, we've talked about Zac Efron. No, get it together, Katie. Fine. We've talked about fan fiction, classical literature adaptations, favorite TV couples, and so much more. So grab your cup of tea or whatever your drink of choice and download our podcast today. Hi, my name is Joe Hogan, and I'm a geek. And if you're currently listening to this, there's a good chance you're a geek too. So check out my podcast, Geektitude. Each week, I talk with somebody about their geek aptitude. Sometimes I talk to people in a geeky profession. Sometimes it's someone doing something really cool with their geekiness. Often it's another geeky podcaster. But it's always someone who wants to share their inner geek. So join me each week as we come together to geek out about all the geeky stuff we love. And remember, this week, keep it geek.